The following is an oral history of the Hanover Area Family YMCA as recorded in the spring of 2003 by two of the Y's founding members and strongest supporters, Mr. Paul Spears and Mr. Ken Leister. Our tremendous growth and success over the last 36 years could not have happened without their continuous support and guidance, and we are grateful to them for all of their efforts. A special thank you also goes to Mr. Jeff Murdell, photography and video communication teacher, and an intern student of his, Megan Smith, at Southwestern High School for their generous donation of time and talent in making this video. We hope you enjoy this walk through history. I, I don't really know because I, I can't recall who had the idea initially to say, why don't we get a lot of people together in the community and, and form a YMCA. Uh, I know that at that time, there really wasn't any place for the young people to go and, and uh, hang out, as they call it. And we needed desperately something like that, some place to go. I think where the young people went, my father-in-law, Morris Fry, had a store downtown called the Maudra. And it was sort of a half a drugstore, a confectionery, had ice cream and Cokes and, and uh, Sundays and stuff like that, and it seemed like all the kids gathered there, but it could only hold so many, and you know you couldn't hold dances there or anything like that. And I think it was just generally felt that the community needed a place like that, and and the YMCA seemed to be the best way to go because of the principles that they have for a young men's Christian association and. So a, a group of us got together and and we met down in the for the first meeting down in the uh, upstairs of the Hanover Public Library and I can't remember all the people that were there but I know it was Grover Gauker who uh, uh, we elected initially as the first president of the Y board and. And Grover did an excellent job. He was uh, very organized. He was extremely articulate. He, he taught uh, speaking, public speaking, for the Dale Carnegie course. And, and uh, when he came to the meeting, he was extremely organized. And he, he had an agenda specifically as to what he thought we ought to be doing and so on. And, and the thing I remember about Grover was he was he always had a list of people that he needed or of jobs that he needed volunteers for and I remember at that time I was young and ambitious and so every time he asked for a volunteer everybody sat there like most people do at meetings and so I would hold up my hand and say I'll I'll do it I'll take care of it and I did and um, that's how I started out as being involved with the Y and, and there were other people there like my good friend Alan Wareheim from Hanover Foods who turned out to be one of the real prime supporters of the Y and a great fundraiser and, and uh, uh, a man by the name of Ed Abenshine who had a factory in town out on Bletner Avenue, and um, uh, Jack Schuler, that was uh, young Jack Schuler's father, he, he was there. Uh, oh, Dr. Devan was another one that was at the initial meeting uh, at the library. Uh, but that's how it got started, was this group of interested people got together in the Hanover Public Library and decided to see what they could do to get a YMCA started. And Grover suggested that 
we get some seed money together. So he said that we needed to get 25 people to put up $1,000 a piece to give us $25,000, and that was the seed money that we got started. That was the first money that we raised. So the people who were there at the meeting all coughed up $1,000 a piece, and then we went out and tapped our friends for a thousand bucks a piece until we got to twenty five thousand. And that's how we how we first got started. I got involved in why just after they decided to come away from not meet at the library. I never was involved meeting at the library. And then there we by that time I suppose we were thinking about, you know, a permanent place, but that was way beyond our sights at that point, and then we would just meet at various places. You remember meeting down at the uh, Farmer's Bank Hall, at the boardroom? Mm -hmm. Different companies would allow us to use their boardroom, or at least a nice sized room, and that's how we kept working ourselves along. But the problem existed there just didn't seem to be that kind of interest at this point that we could depend on money. So every time we tried to run a project, we, we could work the project through to the point of just starting it, and we'd say, well, now we don't have any money, we can't do it. And that happened so many times. And, uh, money was always a problem in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was always a problem. But uh, I don't remember the exact date that, this, uh, let's see, John Wood was the first one, first director that we brought here. Yeah, John was uh, came here from West Virginia. I believe. And he was the first director we had, and one of the problems that we tried to solve in the beginning was to have a place to go. Uh, we couldn't keep just meeting down in the library and you couldn't start bringing in members. If you've got members, you had no place to, to, to go with them. And so, uh, and Dr. Devan was a good friend of mine. And, and I talked to him about uh, getting perhaps him to talk to his wife, uh, Mrs. Devan, uh, who was uh, Lawrence Shepard's daughter, and she owned the building uh, next to where the, the the bank is now on Colonel Street. And I talked to Dr. Devan and, and suggested that perhaps he could get his wife to allow us to have the use of the upstairs in that building on Carlisle Street where uh, the Republican Club had been. And he was successful in doing that and she allowed us to use that uh, second floor. Um, I think there might have been a third floor there. And charged us no rent for it. I started calling my friends uh, who were in the contracting business. Uh, I called Claire Bang and said, Claire, Claire, Claire was really interested in the why. Uh, he had uh, 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 the electric company, um, Swam Electric, and uh, talked to him and he agreed to come down and go all over the wiring in the, in the building there and didn't charge us for it. And I talked to my friend Brunel Mao who had a, a building construction business and he came down and built us an office in there and did some carpentry work and, and I called my friend George Bixler who had a, the plumbing business and George came down and fixed the commodes and the sinks and the showers and did all the plumbing work and didn't charge us for it. 
because that was their, you know, contribution to, to the effort to try to get something started. And then as Ken says, we, once we got that, now we have a home to go to. We have a place we can go to. And then, as Ken said, we, we hired uh, John Wood, who was, came here from uh, West Virginia, and he was the first director. We had the first executive director of the YMCA. And we used to, uh, to keep the interest going, uh, since we had no place to have activities, other than some pool tables that were up in the uh, building that Mrs. Devan allowed us to use. Uh, we used to play basketball every Saturday afternoon at the Eichelberger High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I can remember Claire Bang playing and, and John Wood playing. And a lot of us get together down there. And I can remember Claire Bang because he was a big, robust guy then and, and rough. And he'd run into people and knock them down. And, I always got assigned to guard Claire Bang because <laughs> nobody else wanted to take him on. <clears throat> um, then I guess the first thing Ken we started talking about, remember, was a swimming pool. Yes. Yeah, I, and I, that was uh, the outdoor notorium. I have photos, like, <laughs> newspaper articles yeah. about well, an outdoor notorium complex. Yeah, well, that's right. I think I, I know I was opposed to, <laughs> to building a swimming pool. Very much so. <laughs> I wanted a basketball court because I like to play basketball. Mm -hmm. And it was a selfish thing on my part, but I felt that, you know, basketball was important and that, if I like basketball, I thought the other kids would like basketball. And so I fought hard for a basketball court. But my friend Ken, he supported the swimming pool because he said that there would be a lot of use to that and, and that's where we ought to spend our time and our effort in putting up a swimming pool first. Because we couldn't do everything at one time. You had to do something to get started and you had to pick the most important thing you could get that, that would get the most attention and the most use. And he felt that uh, the swimming pool would get the most use and the most support. And so I lost out and he was right. That was the right thing to do to go with the swimming pool because that did get us started good. We didn't get our outdoor pool that we thought we were going to get. After we decided on the whole thing, then we needed an architect. And of course, uh, Arthur Stabler was, I would think, I'd, I think I'm safe in saying he was a member by that time. Of the, yeah, he was a member of the board. And uh, we uh, drew him in the board. We decided how we wanted, what we wanted, and I think he was the person that sold us on the idea of having a family complex and that we would pay for it better that way than if we just had an open-end trimming pool. So it was projected to be X number of dollars, and I really forget what that board said we could go on. But anyway, when the bids were open, it was twice the price that he had suggested he could build it for. And of course, that made sparks fly. And that's the reason why we don't have one. But uh, therefore, everything was dropped on that. And it was several years then until uh, we got up enough nerve to get working on the, on the building. But it was the forerunner. Everybody had learned a lesson on the thing, and so uh, we did with that. But we also had program, various kinds of programs going on at the Y downtown at that time. And I can remember we bought the Nautilus, 
and put it up there. You remember that, Paul? Mm -hmm. When we started with the first location we had downtown, you, you could play pool on the pool tables, and we fixed up the bowling alleys, and you could bowl there. And I can't recall what other things that we had, maybe badminton, or not badminton, but ping pong. I think that they had some ping pong tables set up there. And I, that, that's all I can remember about the activities that we had there. Everything that we could give somebody some service on, but at least get some money out of them, the dues and so forth, that's what we tried to do. And of course, we still were hitting the brick wall. We just didn't have money. And I can remember so vividly one evening we were sitting at the board meeting and uh, in the meantime we had gotten a new director. John Wood left us and we had to get somebody and we got uh, Dave Cotton. David Cotton. So. Dave came and he, he was a, a director that believed and was trained in camping. And they had a good camping program going. How you all campers, I remember, was one of the group, but it was a family affair. Every weekend, the, the Y was empty because they, they'd be outdoors and they'd be in camping trips. But uh, we got along pretty well, but we still hit this snag of not having any money. So we were sitting at a board meeting one evening and I was getting so tired of hearing about this fact we don't have any money. And I said, well, gentlemen, there weren't any ladies there then yet. And I said, gentlemen, I think there's one thing you were missing. We have never asked the community whether they want a YMCA and we should ask them and by asking them, I'm saying that we'd develop a drive, a membership drive to where they would pay for it. And I, I really would like to make a motion that we do this, and if we can't, if the drive is not successful, we simply pay Dave Cotton what we owe him and pay the other monies that we owe people and close the doors. We're not getting any place and we don't know where the community even wants it. Well, they took that and at that very evening, I was sitting there on the back of a piece of paper f figuring out what we could get from a lot of our supporters and new supporters. And Paul was sitting beside me and he leaned over, he said, Ken, how much do you have there? As near as I can tell, I came up with something like $35,000. And I think I'm right on that, but I'm not positive. But anyway, they bought the idea. We went out and had a very successful drive, went over the top. We could keep Dave, and we got rolling. And then the other thing I think that was so helpful to us was Dave said to us one day, you know, there's an organization in York that we ought to either become part of or ask them to come here and tell us about it and have one ourselves. And it was the ARP. And we had never heard of the ARP organization before. so. My wife and another lady that was helping up at the Y at that time, a volunteer, and some other people went along with Dave down to York to one of the ARP meetings. And they came back and they said, that's what we need. So that's how the Y got involved with the ARP organization. And I don't have to say anything, it, it, the ARP got so big that the Y couldn't even handle anything, so they were off on their own. But 
they also were very appreciative of the wise activities and they lended a lot of help and also it was a place for get to get membership <laughs> but anyway uh, Dave did a real good job of getting that organization into the Y and out on their own really because as I said it was too large we couldn't even handle it but it was a means of money that was the, the big thing that was important then and uh, from that drive and from the little bit of help that ARP helped on, it really got going. And thinking about what Ken was saying about raising the money, I remember the, when we were trying to raise money initially for the swimming pool, that young Jack Shore and I got together and decided to take a street in Hanover and hit every door on that street and see how much money we could raise. And we started out early in the morning and we decided on Lee Street. And we hit every house on Lee Street and told them our story about how we needed this money to, to build this swimming pool. And we hit every house on Lee Street, and at the end of the day, we hadn't received a nickel. And I went home about four or five o'clock in the afternoon, and I was really discouraged, because I thought, you know, we spent the whole day, we hit every house on Lee Street, and nobody would give us anything. And my phone rang shortly after I got home, and it was my friend Paul Wooster, who used to run Fisher's store on Carlisle Street. And he said, I heard that you were out trying to raise money for the Y. And I said, yes. And he said, how much did you get? And I said, nothing. And he said, well, so that this wasn't a total failure for you. I'm going to send you a check. And he sent us a check for $25. And that's the first <laughs> money I remember raising. <laughs> and it's a long way from there to where we are today. <laughs> and back in the beginning, you know, we didn't have any land. We didn't, we not only didn't have much of a home, I mean, we had some temporary quarters on Carlow Street, but we needed a place where Eventually, we could see a, a building going up and have a place where we could have something for the members, if we could get members, and, and where we could build someday a swimming pool and where we could build someday a gymnasium and other things. And, and we were very fortunate to have somebody like uh, Mike Rice's grandfather who owned Arts Potato Chip Company at that time, they call it. And he was very community-minded, and he donated to us the land the Y, the present Y, is now located on. And I th think there was something like five or six acres there. And uh, it's right along George Street. So now we got some land. And then we could start thinking about raising money to build a building. And I remember being chairman of, I think, the first major fundraiser that we had. And, and I went to all the corporate people that I knew and at that time. Um, Hanover Shoe was a strong supporter of the Y because I worked there. Hanover Shoe Farms was a strong supporter of the Y because I worked there. And all the executives that worked there, I tapped all of them. Alan Wareheim was very instrumental in helping to raise money from not only his company, Hanover Brands, and 
and uh, the uh, what was then the Farmers Bank, uh, but also then he he talked to other f corporate friends that he had in the community and and. Ken Leister was very instrumental in raising a lot of money. And I think back in the beginning, the three major f fundraisers were, were Ken Leister and Alan Wareheim and, and myself. Uh, and we worked on every major fund, capital fund drive that, that the Y had. Well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, there's been a tremendous change in the support for the Y and the interest in the Y. When we first started to talk about the YMCA in 1968, there wasn't a whole lot of interest within the community outside of the initial group of people like us who were interested in it and trying to promote the idea. But now, I think that the YMCA has become a, a focal point for the whole community. Uh, I ride by there every time I have to go out of town. I make sure I go down George Street and look at the number of automobiles that are there. And it's just incredible to me to see where we have come from and where we are today. And it's not just uh, one age group of people. You've got young children out there. You've got teenagers. You've got uh, young adults. You've got elderly people. We have something there for everybody in this community, and it's and it's a family-oriented YMCA. And I can remember that that Ken uh, pushed that very hard in the in the formative stages of the Y, that it should be a family-oriented YMCA. It shouldn't appeal to any one specific group of people, but you should try to get the whole family involved. And that's been the theme of the, the Hanover area family YMCA throughout, and I think it's paid off. I think it was the right way to go. And we had, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Um, it was difficult in the beginning trying to raise money. Um, today we've got 11,000 members here. Uh, we're taking care of maybe 600 children every day out there. We've got a uh, branch up in Littlestown now and exploring the possibility of having other branches. Uh, this, this thing has grown far beyond anything that I ever expected in, in the beginning. Well, I think it's helped to pull people together. I think it's helped to get people uh, to support something that is good for the community. You know, all too often people think of things in their own little parochial way that they're just thinking about what's good for them and not what's good for everybody. And of course, that's not just here in Hanover. That's, that's worldwide. It's everywhere. But when you have something like the YMCA and the YWCA that people believe in because they see the good that it does, I mean, you've got children who now have a place to go where the parents work or maybe a single parent has to work and what do they do if they don't have a place to, to put
put their child. But here, they've got a place to go with that child.